is the Doomer Optimism Podcast. Uh, speaking is Twitter Anon and adjunct co-host, I guess, uh, Anarcho Contrarian, which is awkward to say. So I suppose uh, for the sake of conversation, you can just uh, call me Anarcho if you call me anything at all, I guess. Um, so I'm joined tonight and hosting by my good friend uh, and notorious, I guess, uh, complexity scientist, Joe Norman. Joe, how's it going tonight? Hey, it's going great. I'm excited to talk to Ben. And uh, yeah, I'm going to call you AC, kind of like AC. All right, that's good. <laughs> good, good. Uh, so today, uh, Joe and I have really the tremendous uh, pleasure and honor of chatting with uh, somebody who we both admired for, for quite a long time, uh, being a fellow a Northern New Englander, uh, a man who really that we think the Doomer Optimism audi audience should absolutely know, uh, Mr. Ben Fox. So Ben, thanks for, for joining us. Hey, thanks for having me here. And I'm looking forward to chatting with you guys. Awesome, awesome. Uh, so Ben, I, I first got turned on to your work probably over a decade ago uh, on your, I think your first appearance with Jack Spierko in the Survival Podcast. Um, and, and you blew me away, to be honest. Uh, and, and I've been following along ever since. Uh, and Joe's been a fan as well. And I'm sure we'll talk a little bit about you know, some of the parallels he, he sees in his work and yours and some of the references he's actually made to your work and his. Um, but for, for those that might not be familiar with you, can you just give us a, a quick overview? Like, who, who is Ben Falk? What do, you, what do you do? Where do you live? Uh, some of the basics, if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, well, I am a home, you know, bit of a homesteader. I don't think I'm myself as very hardcore right now. I've got a four-year-old, almost four years old. And um, so I'm a dad more than I probably am a homesteader right now. Um, kind of farm here and there, but I don't consider myself a farmer because I don't you know, mostly make my economic living farming. Um, I'm a site designer, you know, landscape architect, site planner um, for part of what I do for money, um, help other people design and set up their land-based systems and lifestyles to some extent. I used to be a carpenter and done a lot. Of, I like building stuff. I've been doing a lot of welding in the last handful of years. And that's still super exciting. Um, yeah, I like fixing things that break. And uh, I have a book, so I guess I'm an author, although I don't really like to write very much. And, um, you know, mostly I like being outside <laughs> pretty much. Um, yeah, I, I guess I'll leave it at that. Yeah, I think you're being entirely too modest. <laughs> um, I, I, I like to use, and, and honestly, we're not even close to on the same level because I've been doing this for just a, a, like three years now. I've been trying to kind of uh, crack the homesteading, uh, whatever lifestyle. Um, but I say what I'm doing is homesteading light. Uh, similarly, I have a young child expecting a second child soon here. And so it's, it's tough to, uh, and that's, that's some of the things I'd love to, to, to talk to you about tonight. Um, like, how do you juggle the massive bandwidth that's required to approach anything uh, uh, like self-sufficiency? Um, and of course, doing it while you're, you're having professional engagements and whatnot. Um, yeah. I don't know. I don't know. We could, should we just jump into the meat of it like that? That's, that's how sure, I work. That's a, yeah. That's as good a question as any, <laughs> even though the answers aren't very satisfying. Um, so how, how is that done? Um, well, sometimes some days better than others. Um, mostly it's triage, you know, it's just thinking about what is the most important thing at the time and um, what's gonna, you know, what's gonna, just be the highest leverage thing to do. So I always put up, you know, there's things I have done that I don't do anymore and things that I do every year. And I probably, as long as my body works well enough, I will do every year. So you think like some things that people know me for is like growing rice. You know, I don't grow rice anymore in, in patties. That was nice to do, but it's not, um, it didn't prove so valuable that I should do it every year. But there's a lot of things I do do every year, like grow potatoes, grow garlic, put up all my wood in by April, end of April to dry for the winter. So we have, you know, every last bit of heat we need for our heat and, and hot water. 
um, grow squash, although this year that was challenging, grow greens. Um, yeah, you know, have bad backup water, have well water, spring water on hand, um, make sure those systems are always going and, and, and functional. Um, always be making compost, you know, the, the essential things, put up a lot of food for the winter in freezers, in root cellars. Um, yeah, those kinds of things. So that happens every winter, every year, no matter what, but, um, you know, some things fall away. I mean, you know, like this year, there were certain crops that didn't do well. Like our squash crop, as I mentioned, didn't do well. So we went to a farm and I bought a bunch of squash and I traded honey, which I have a lot of now for a bunch of other squash. Um, but that's, you know, and a real essential to have a lot of squash for the winter because it keeps and it's versatile and, you know, I, garlic onions as well did manage to grow oh, a year's worth of those the last few years running well garlic for almost 20 years but the onions it took a while to get good at onions and shallots um but yeah it's just about focusing on i guess on the on the the most essential things and then a big thing i should mention is getting all this stuff going before we uh our son came into our life so he's almost four. So I was at this lifestyle for, you know, 15 years about uh, before that. And if you can do that, I would definitely recommend it. <laughs> um, I see people get into, you know, homesteading and farming and more self-reliant living, you know, with kids from the beginning. And that's amazing. Um, that's like heroic. That's a real act of heroism to do. I, 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 you know, that's daunting um, to think about, but, you know, I think just like parenting, you know, you don't know what you can do and you don't know how you're going to do it until you just have to do it. And so I think those people figure it out. And at some point the kids start to be helpful, you know, a net help. Um, you know, I don't think I'm, I feel like I'm years away from that still, but maybe depending on the child, you know, by the time they're, I don't even want to guess six, eight, 10, 12. They hopefully are helping more than they're hurting. <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I'm, we're ways away from that now. So like the last three years of my life have been like terribly unproductive compared to the 15 years before. And I guess I've been mostly okay with that uh, because I had 15 good years of cranking you know, and just going hard on the systems. Um, I feel like if you can, it'd be good to get five, 10 years, you know, of cranking everything out before you have someone to take care of, like that's a total dependent. Um, but, you know, not everyone has that luxury or has that, or makes that choice intentionally, or, you know, it has those circumstances. So you can certainly do it differently. And I, I do see people doing it differently. And sometimes without crazy burning out and, you know, like chaos all the time. Um, also, you do have to be very high tolerance to chaos. You know, my wife and I have ongoing, not like argument, but just kind of like tension around, like she doesn't like as much chaos. And I'm just like, you know, it is what it is. That's going to be, I kind of write it off as that our life is going to have a lot of chaos, like tripping over stuff on the ground because my son throws everything around for, you know, there's going to be like five years where that's just like the reality um, and things are a mess. And, you know, like just like the lack of like order in the home, you know, cleanliness, um, I don't, I, I'm kind of okay with, but, um, you know, you go to people's houses and you see like everything's put away and neat and clean. And it's like, no, that's the, it's funny when people call the simple life, like there's nothing simple life about homesteading. It's like definitely the complex life. It's simple, like go in your house, turn on a thermostat. You don't care where the heat from comes from. You don't have to think about it. Someone else did it. You know, you just have to go do something for 40 hours a week or 50 or 60 hours a week and pay them. In a lot of ways, that's actually really simple. It's totally hellacious in my view for me to do that, but it's definitely simple. Um, it's much more complex to go out and drop trees 
all November and December and get them out and buck them and dry them carefully and you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and everything is like that. It's more complex. Um, so I'm not, I'm not sure where the term the simple life came from. That's pretty funny, but um, it's, it's got a lot of chaos to it. And it's just about, I think, you know, keeping it, keeping it a bit manageable, but which has to do with your tolerance and, you know, how organized you are. If you can have some infrastructure in place, that's a real benefit. So, yeah, that, that's one of the things I'm wondering as you're talking. So you talk about, you had that 15 years up front. I'm, I'm one of those people who does not have that upfront period. Um, so we'll see how everything goes. That said, that's part of the reason I sort of say I'm doing homestead light to kind of give myself the space to, uh, you sure. know, not be so hard on myself, et cetera. But um, having those, your sort of site um, up and running, so to speak, these past three, four years, how has it run as you imagined it would with less input and less attention or, or what surprised you about how it's run? Yeah, I, it has. I mean, on the whole, you know, the veggie gardens suffer. As soon as you step off the gas, you know, immediately your veggie, any annual systems respond, uh, you know, accordingly. Um, even though you can build up some good soil and definitely get rid of your weeds and there's multiple years of, um, of accumulation of value in those, you know, where you're paying it forward, where you do benefit. Um, like if you have raised beds or nice line beds with boards, you know, wood, some kind of edging. So you keep the weeds out, grass out, you build your soil, you get your weeds down in your weed bed and you have, or in your weed, excuse me, in your seed bed and you get your compost going, you know, you could still grow veggies with less work, but they immediately, you know, you immediately each year um, have less success if you're stepping off the gas. But the cool thing about perennials is one of the cool things is that's definitely not the case. So in the last three years, I've done way less work around planting, around pruning, around mulching, apples, pears, currants, sea berry, autumn berry, you name it, all of the perennials. And they're producing more this year than they did last year, than they did the year before, than they did the year before that for 10, 15 years before that. So we can't even come close to eating and processing all of the perennial fruits that are in our system, um, even though we're doing ever less work for them. So that's cool. That's, that's the way you want the, the input output graphs to, to be. Um, it's not like that with veggie growing and, and veggie growing is important, I think. Um, but that's, that's one nice thing about the perennials. We're not quite there with the nuts. I mean, our, our oldest walnuts that I planted almost 20 years ago are really starting to crank, but they're not, not to the point of like where we have an endless supply of walnuts that we can eat, although we're getting there. So can you can you take us through Ben uh, a little bit more? You know your two different properties, um, just you know some of the basic systems, and maybe you just talk through like food foresting, food food foresting, excuse me, um, and, and livestock, and how you operate those two on both your different properties. Yeah, well, the original site is mostly a food forest. Now we have raised sheep there uh, in the past for a while. So it has a silvo pasture component. Um, but then when we started to endeavor to develop this other site 10 years in to the original site, which is now basically 10 and 10, because we've been pretty much going for 20 years. Um, so now we're almost 10 years in the new site. And that site's much more of a silvo pasture, you know, larger scale um, silvo pasture system that's most of the, where the engine is but then there's a developing food forest zone one you know big veggie garden kind of perennial landscape food edible landscape around you know zone one um which is more like akin to the original site like a garden of eden you know just foodscape um which in the end is kind of the the coolest part about these systems i think is just being in a in the Garden of Eden. Um, the second site was definitely more of a commercial planting from the beginning. So it took a little longer. That wasn't like the forward, it wasn't food forest forward 
like the first site was. It was more like key line silvo pasture forward. And uh, then now we're still kind of wrapping up some of the food forest aspects of it. Not that it's ever done, but we're still planting some of that. Um, they're very different sites. You know, the original site's west facing and very heavy clay over most of it and steep and bouldery and 10 acres. And the, the second site is bigger and it has generally better soil and, you know, it's much more like agriculturally productive. Um, and there's a lot more woods. So I, I'm doing like a lot more forestry on the second site. Whereas the first site was, you know, much more like I wasn't managing, you know, acres and acres of woods of woodland there. Sure. And you live on the first site, right? And, and how, lo how long have you been there? When did you? Um, we've the been site? we've been on the first site for, you know, 19 years. Yeah, okay. that's awesome. And tell, tell us more about like your structures, um, you know, your home, your workshops. Yeah. How, how um, have you set those systems up? Yeah, you know, workshop space was is was the main main key thing early on. I mean, the first year, two years, I definitely had like the classic blue tarp over all sorts of stuff. You know, just like reaching under a blue tarp every day, trying to find stuff that was, you know, getting wet and rusting and you know, kind of chaos early on. So immediately, I kind of retrofitted this um, single car garage that was on site to become a shop. So put a chop saw table in, you know, just kind of like emergency, like we need workspace, put a wood stove in it, chop saw table, you know, kind of classic, just get it to be functional. And then out of that space, eventually after like four or five years, we built the office studio shop, which then we built a barn out of another three to four years later. And so now there's a full on, you know, barn workshop above building and there's an you know office studio building. And then there's the original house on the property. So it's got a nice, and there's a big greenhouse on the barn. Um, it has, you know, there's no need for more infrastructure for like a large family um, is pretty much how it is now. Uh, and, and but you, it, said you were, you were a, a, a carpenter. Uh, you, you did carpentry kind of before you. you yeah. Did, woodworking uh, carpentry. And so you, I, I presume then you built this stuff out that you're talking about. Yeah. With, I mean, definitely with help. I, I definitely yeah. hired a lot of help here and there because at times I've had, you know, less money than time and skills. And then sometimes I've had more money than time. So, you know, just hire a bunch of people. So yeah, I've kind of done it all ways. Uh -huh. I've built a bunch of buildings just single by myself. Like I built a cow shed the other day, last two weeks ago, it was like three days solo, didn't have any help, but a track, I had a tractor holding things up and that that's fun. It, it's nice to be able to build things single-handedly, but um, I built the greenhouse on the second site with no help and a bunch of stuff, but um, definitely a lot of the bigger infrastructure I've hired help for, um, for sure. But I knew, you know, I knew how to design these things and continue to learn how to design them and, and generally how they go together by, you know, being in the building trade um, professionally, you know, for a bit before a lot of it too. So that's definitely helpful. I mean, a lot of people go about doing some really, uh, making big mistakes with the infrastructure. What, so, so what I was going to ask, and so now I'm interested in what you just said as well, but what I was going to ask is, is your design process um, for the permaculture systems, for the buildings, is there a similar design process that you use or, or do you see those differently? And then what you just said, I was also interested in, in uh, the mistakes that people make and what are the mistakes that you see? What are the mistakes maybe you've mm -hmm. made, uh, et cetera? Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, permaculture and ecological design um, apply to the built systems just as much as the landscape systems, um, I think, for the most part. But, I mean, they really do shine with biological systems. But, um, you know, they're all applicable, basically, to, to, to the built environment. Um, you know, it's just much more of a physics and engineering project than... You know, it is working with plants and soil and animals 
it does it's a very different skill set it's a much harder i feel like the plants and animals and soil and water it's like a softer skill set in terms of like different part of the brain different part of the the mind the heart you know like in terms of like who's good at one or the other and and um you know, it's a little more, I don't want to say more artistic because there's plenty of art in the in the building end of it, but you got to kind of listen maybe a little more carefully and have a little bit of a softer side to be good at those living system side of it. And the building system side is, um, you know, it's, it's, it's engineering a lot of it and it's, it's knowing how water affects the buildings and, and wind and you know, how things are structurally sound. And really in this climate, it's honestly so much about water detailing and just building. So you don't have rot problems in year five or 10. And hopefully you, you push them out to year 50 or 60 or whatever, but you're, you're building things that are going to last because you've really thought through and detailed the, the moisture issues really well. Cause that's, we're in a very difficult part of the world being cold and wet uh, to, to build in a way that the moisture doesn't really mess with the buildings pretty quickly. That, that, that's really interesting. Yeah, my house actually was, it, it's an old mill property, um, you know, like water powered mill. And um, there's a, a couple of brooks, one that runs really close to the house. Uh, AC ha, ha, has seen it and seen uh, what can happen with it. But one of the things that's amazing about this house is sitting right next to the brook, right in Southern New Hampshire, cold and wet, all of that, no moisture issues whatsoever. The building was oh. around 1890. Um, oh. so, so they did something right with that. Um, yeah, that's, that's interesting. So, so what other, what mistakes in general have you seen people make, uh, with their infrastructure and what, like, like how should people think about you know, avoid. Yeah. Mistakes. Well, the biggest, I mean, I think that the biggest like type one error is putting buildings in the wrong place, you know, just putting buildings either too low in the landscape um, is a common one. Um, what problems well, stem from that? I'm, I'm curious. Um, well, too low in the landscape in terms of elevation, I mean, is like just you know, moisture, you know, not being able to have positive drainage away from the building. Mm. So, we work with a lot of projects where there often is an architect involved or was involved and they love to, love to put buildings like low for aesthetics, which I totally get, but often it can be, you know, if you're on a very flat site, it can be really hard to get positive drainage away from the building. And that can be, if you're on a very low angle site, that can be pretty much a perpetual challenge and hard to fix. Um, you can be in a place where you, if you put the building in a, um, the wrong spot, let's say if you don't have a, a sunnier location, you put it in a less sunny, you can have always have moisture issues because you're not, you don't get enough sun, you know, on the site, on the building, you know, it, you always get moisture problems in this climate. It's easy to see where a building's going to be rotted. Even from a distance, you can walk up, I can walk up to a building and guess where there's going to be moisture problems because often they're on the northeast north or northeast facing corners you know you're going to often have moisture issues there um, even if they're in sunny spots but much more so if they're not so putting them in, you know kind of in the shade uh buildings really need to dry out here and get air and sun um you know i mean if people aren't thinking about it at all, they'll, they'll face the building the wrong way. They'll have, you know, all the windows on the north side or the east side instead of the south side and just, you know, ignore the sun. That's an easy one. But, you know, there's no getting over if you just put a building on the wrong site too. So like picking a site where you have no solar access or there's a neighbor immediately to the south. And so you can't cut any of the trees down because they're your neighbors. And so you have no sun in the middle of the winter. Um, you know, imagine like a north facing hemlock grove, you know, things that are just pretty much insurmountable in terms of just going to be a very dark, cold place and rot prone. Um, putting buildings where it can flood, you know, where a stream can flood, flood a building. That's not that uncommon. Um, sometimes easy to avoid. Um, I mean, picking, a, picking the wrong site is the is common and it's the biggest one and even when people are 
have goals to to use their property productively that that is often people don't pick the sites very well and that we can talk about site selection a lot that's like one of my favorite topics and really what i about the best thing that i do for a living is help people with that but um you know building there's some endless mistakes i mean people are dump snow right on their walkway with the roof lines oftentimes or just don't moisture detail the roofs and the eaves really well and have you know, water getting into windows or getting into the foundation, um, poor materials, poor workmanship is very common too. Maybe maybe it's a good segue to talk a little bit more about whole systems design, um, you know, where, where you operate, what kind of work do you primarily do? Is it is it primarily site selection versus, you know, design after the fact, um, you know, who, who are your customers typically? What are some of the problems that you find yourself typically solving? If you could sort of walk us through that. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, whole system design does, we kind of go from the one end to the other in terms of people moving to a rural place, usually rural, but sometimes suburban-ish. Um, and so we start, we help people choose a site. That's my favorite thing I can do for people because it's the most, it's really the most potent way I can help them think through what site is best for their goals, for their project, their family, you know, their need to be near a school or not, need to be near a town or not, general locations, all of that. And then we design, once we've, often we'll go through the whole, We'll, we'll work with clients at any piece of the part of the process, but we we start with that. I, the ideal project is we help people with that. And then we design the site with them, come up with a site plan in the studio. Um, the whole system design collective is our office in New Hampshire that we move those projects through. And then we sometimes help implement and manage the projects but mostly it's like helping people choose the site and designing the system and you know mostly we we step away then and we're not you know we're not like a landscape management company and uh we generally don't do much implementation unless they're pretty close to where i live in in uh vermont and or where my colleague lives in maine do, do you primarily do northern New England? Do you find yourself there most? Well, we we work all over um, the country, and I mean, I've consulted in other countries too, plenty of times. Uh, mostly Europe, a little bit in South America, Canada, but yeah, mostly in the U.S. We have design projects currently all over the U.S., um, but mo but most we do focus, and most of our work is in New England and New York State. I'd say, um, and then maybe maybe a lot of my consults are in Vermont, but I, I you know I do have come done consults in many states too, um, so it's kind of all over. But I'd say New England is is the primary focus. Yeah. Oh hell yeah! Um, yeah, um, exactly. So so. so um, so you're doing site selection. Obviously, there's all these uh, contextual issues coming to play, like you're mentioning, like things outside of permaculture, you know, is there a school? Do you need one? Is there a town? Do you desire one, et cetera? Um, but with respect to the landscape part of it, when you start to, when you come across a site, you're looking at a new place, does, uh, what I'm really curious about is when things start clicking for you about like what might go where and how the kind of broad scope part of the, the plan starts to unfold in, in, in your mind or however you would describe that. Yeah, it totally varies on the site. So I'll do a lot of site consults for people who are looking to build a new home and we're just walking raw land, you know, and without a driveway, without an access. And um, I would say, you know, half the time, it's pretty clear, okay, there's one logical place to put a driveway because every other option is super far. And there's one like good spot for a house, or maybe there's two, but one that's pretty clear. Maybe a third of the time it's, you can start moving towards, okay, we know the house is probably going to be here and here's going to be the access. And then everything unfolds from there. Those are the two primary things, access, house location. Septic can be another big determining factor, but not 
often as much as those two. And maybe a third of the time while I do the site visit, you know, I'm not saying, yeah, this is where those are going to go, but it's like probably looking pretty clear. And um, then we can start the site design process now with that information. But at least more than half of the sites, it's it's not that clear. There's like a lot of op- a lot of potentially good options for a house site, or at least maybe two or three. And then sometimes there's different access options, although usually that's less um, numerous. And um, so then we bring the project into the studio and we do the analyses process where we identify the limiting factors and the, the, the clearest opportunities of the site with microclimate, soils, steepness of slope, water conditions, et cetera, et cetera. And that helps us arrive at options for the schematic design, which is like options, which is like various ways you can develop the site. So schemes are option, let's say one, two, and three, and you place the elements in different relationships in each scheme. So then you can look at them all and say, all right, there's pros and cons of each of these and overlay them to get the maximum synergy. And that's, we try to basically have the client make those decisions. I mean, ultimately it's, it is their decision, but we try to be interpreters of the site where the, and, and bring the site and their goals together so that they can decide in a, a really informed way where the best place for all the major elements are. Um, so it's more of a coaching process and like waving your hands around like an architect and say, ah, look at this brilliant idea. Let's do this. You know, that's not a, a scientific design process in our mind. That's, that's, uh, that's art and that can be good, but it's usually catastrophic. And uh, that's, that's the way most architects work still. And I, I and maybe some people know how I feel about most architects because of that. I guess we're finding out. Uh, please, please. I mean, it's just, it's hard not to use them as an example, unfortunately. Well, I mean, uh, uh, you must be at least uh, familiar with, uh, uh, in name, perhaps, Chris Alexander and uh, mm. his pattern language and all of that. I mean, it's very sure. resonant with with the design processes that, that you talk about. Right. Um, so, you know, maybe, maybe some architects are, are okay. Oh, yeah. Know. No, I mean, he was a total heretic. Right. He is a total heretic in the architect field in that way because right. he said, you know, this this design should be conducted by the inhabitants of the site. Right, right. And architecture still hasn't, you know, fully by any means come around to that. No, certainly not. As a field. <laughs> right, not right. that there's probably not some great architects out there doing that, but they are very few and far between. A- absolutely. And I mean, it's not just the architects, right? It's actually, I mean, the fact that we have this... Uh, expert class that we call architects is already a sign that something has has gone wrong in that way. So yeah, yeah, the the whole system kind of reinforces those kinds of processes. So it's it's tough to break out of it. So, so that I'm I'm curious more generally then how did, where did you, um, well, I'm kind of in two fronts. One, I'm, I'm a, by career, I do system science. Um, So I'm always involved in, in system science in some way or another, not typically on over landscapes and whatnot, although in my personal life, I'm trying to do a bit of that. Um, so, so I'm curious how you got to systems in your personal life, how you found your way there to think in mm. terms of systems is just a natural proclivity or did some uh, experiences kind of lead you that way? Uh, and I'm so I'm interested in that. I'm also interested in more almost the existential side of, of what led you to this uh, kind of systems life and in, embedded in, a, in, in permaculture type of systems and choosing to live this way. Mm-hmm. Well, I remember in... Um college you know coming across um like peter Senge's work and um alan savory's you know holistic management and donella meadows i think her book one of her books thinking in systems um eugene odom you know i've i read the permaculture designers manual like kind of halfway through college and but around then had been coming across some systems theory and stuff. And then with the footnotes in Mollison's book and Holmgren's book delved into that in other ways too. And um, 
I guess it was a way of, it was an articulation and, and John Todd's work, I shouldn't be, I'd be remiss not to mention his work being, you know, really primary in terms of ecological design and all of these guys pointing back at Buckminster Fuller and some other great designers. But I guess I was mostly in the sense then that all of this like was obviously true. It wasn't like conjecture or wasn't, um, it was just a reinforcement of things I felt like I already was common sense. Um, I can't say why that was, and I still feel that way, that it, like systems thinking should be common sense. And I, I think it is, um, although it's not common, I guess, as I've come to feel, but it, it should be common sense. And I think ultimately, it felt like it was for me in college when I was reading it. And I remember arguing with one of my friends who was talking about some of the stuff. And I'm like, this is all like really like basic, like we all know this to be true and it all jives with our lived reality. Um, and I remember just him thinking, no, like this is a topic we have to learn about, which I do agree. We do have to learn about it, but it's not, um, I don't know. It shouldn't, it shouldn't, it's weird that it's been thought of as like a foreign idea that we have to kind of confront and like bring into ourselves and not just like something that's very much like, I don't know if a priori would be the right way of putting it, but it's just, it's built in like. So, so one of the things, so I teach courses on, on complex system science, that kind of thing. And one of the things I always mention up front is that what we're really trying to do in these courses is unlearn a lot of stuff that we've picked up along the way, formed right. habits around, but is just wrong. Right. And, and so I totally agree. I mean, I think this is how people tend to do things, tend to think until they're kind of infected with some other way. And then it's just so pervasive and all around that if, if that starts to feel like common sense. Yeah. But as you're saying, you know, we yeah, look around I, the world and this is how the world actually seems to operate is in systems, clearly. Yeah. And so it, so, so it, I'm, I'm fully with you on that. It's, a, it's, yeah, a it's almost an unlearning like process. We have to learn that things are disconnected. And then w when we kind of knew in a more, in, uh, in a more um, inherent way that things probably are connected we learn them to be disconnected then we have to relearn that oh actually they're all connected i mean i remember growing up thinking if i and for a while i totally thought this was the case that if i flush the toilet when the sink was going the toilet con you know the stuff in the toilet could come out the sink and i didn't know much about plumbing and i know that's that's wrong but inherently I was like this plumbing's all connected and my sister she flushed the toilet while like someone was running the sink in the bathroom I was like no 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 like that's sketchy like I know it hasn't happened but like that's probably a bad idea and so I guess I my mind's always been like yeah, these things are probably connected and that plumbing is actually connected I know that for a fact now not in a way that usually that can happen but it is actually totally connected um I don't know. It's an interesting kind of example, personally. That no, I no, no. But it's like, it's like assume where you can't see, where there's opacity, assume things are connected. Don't yeah. assume they're not. Assume that you can press over here and something over there will show up. That's a good assumption. It's a bit of like a systems paranoia type of approach that some people seem to have. I'm one of them. And, and you know, actually it brings, it, it, it reminds me of uh, one of the things I wanted to talk about that's in your book. Um, I actually wrote a, a short blog post about today leading up to this. I was thinking about chatting with you one of your your charts which is basically i remember always the way i rearrange it but you have it as um, um ba basically that the more uh something is irreversible some change is irreversible the more time you need to take to observe and kind of think about what am i doing here don't just kind of rush in to uh some irreversible decisions and and and, and actions and um I, i'm just curious um for one do i have that have that right from from your perspective that i read that chart properly and 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 two is is this something that you kind of operationalize on the regular and how, how do you do that i think maybe some of the things you're talking about with developing options of design plans might speak to some of that but but mm -hmm. if you could riff on that a little bit i'd love to hear yeah that. well i think that is um nothing more than what um like pa yeomans articulated in the scale of permanence you know in his work that permaculture has drawn a lot of um, 
you know, information and inspiration from, which is just that, you know, just what you explained. I mean, the, the more permanent uh, uh, an aspect of the land use system of the land system is, um, the more you should design around that, um, and the less you should design around things that are more easy to change. Um, so, you know, don't get your road in the wrong spot, you know, get, get plantings in the wrong spot more because you can, you can deal with that more easily than you deal with moving a road or moving a building, um, you know, consider geology before soils, consider climate before plants, you know, there's a hierarchy, there's those hierarchies. Um, but I think maybe it's a little, a little riff on Yeoman's scale of permanence to just more of a managerial uh, implication of, you know, don't screw up, try to screw up the smaller things versus the bigger things and the bigger, the implication, you know, of, of a decision, the more careful, you know, you need to be about making that decision. And so have you, jump. have you personally made any uh, decisions where you say, oh shit, I should have, I wish I could reverse this more easily. Is that? Yeah. I feel like I almost have several times where, well, I mean, I made plenty of mistakes, but I'm thinking like big things, like put the, put a building in the wrong place. Um, I don't think I've done that. <laughs> I mean, some may argue otherwise, but I don't think so. They'd have to live where I live a while to, to know, but, um, or put roads in the wrong place. Um, I've certainly put plants in the wrong place, you know, many times, somewhat, sometimes unavoidably, because I didn't, they should do well there, but they didn't. Uh, but sometimes in ways I could have learned, like, like I planted a lot of chestnuts in the first five years in poorly drained situations. That I just know now chestnuts can't deal with that. Um, I didn't know that then. Um, so yeah, a lot of little mistakes, but I don't, I don't feel like, I think the biggest design error that I feel like I've made in is in the first site is not establishing enough access throughout the field, uh, throughout the property to get it everywhere enough to manage it all well enough. And, you know, in retrospect, I actually think that's, that was hard to do because there's just wet areas and boulders and there's, it's a hard site to have good access, but and in the end, I kind of recouped that and got a big access way through it. But I wasn't designing around that in the beginning as well as I could have, for sure. Um, but if you can't, you know, access this primary, if you can't get to it, it's kind of useless, at least in terms of getting a yield or managing it, you know. Totally. Yeah. When we first got here, I started blazing some trails, um, just hand trails, just to, for, for that reason, to, to establish some access on foot, at least to some places. And really, I had uh, drawn up some nice plans of all the, the trail systems I'd like to have. And then uh, our baby came along and I haven't made any trail progress since then. But, but I, I, one of the things that I've recognized is, is, well, without access, obviously, you can't use it. You also can't even start to think about how you might use it. Right. Uh, right. You can't see what's going on there. Um, and even like little things just like thinning out a little bit of forest, all of a sudden, the, the possible utility starts to reveal itself at least that's been my experience um and and in shocking ways where i we we also live on a hilly site and so flat space is at an absolute premium and sometimes i don't realize oh there actually is a decent areas of, of flat areas here but they're all kind of hidden in the forest and whatnot so i definitely hear yeah. that one um yeah so yeah. so thanks i appreciate that i sorry i, I know i talked over ac uh, yeah, no worries. Uh, I, I was really intrigued by the thing that you said, and it was sort of made, reminded me um, of a book that actually you, you turned me on to. So you, you said uh, something along the lines that, you know, people who live on the landscape should be the ones that design the buildings, uh, design the system as, as well, maybe. But so you actually turned me on to one of my favorite like, design books, I, I guess you could call it a design book, uh, Big House, Little House, uh, Back House, Barn. Mm -hmm. um you know which being a northern new englander um i like totally fawn for old school homesteads and i'm just wondering like um i'm sure you live in close proximity to plenty of them like how much do you draw on you know the old homesteads of new england and their design elements into your work you know what what do you admire if anything about about the old homestead layouts um and i guess the, the, my last question would be like 
are those places worth saving? In my opinion, they are, but I'd like to hear from you. Yeah. Um, well, the last question is the easiest one to answer because yeah, absolutely, yes, <laughs> they're, they're worth saving. And with just a little bit of tweaking, they might be about as good as we can do. Um, like if you insul if you find a sweet old connected farmstead, the only way to really improve those things, I mean, they got so many design decisions correct because they had to because they had so many constraints to work with that's such little energy, you know, they couldn't just pump heat into their house and turn up the electricity, you know, they had to passively harvest energy. Um, and they were fully engaged in their landscape, they were living off of their land, usually. Um, there's, there's a few clear ways it can be improved because of things they just didn't have, like maybe double pane windows or triple pane windows, or at least storm windows, and maybe more glass here and there, and better insulation in the buildings. But, you know, short of that, <laughs> they pretty much, you know, did most everything that you would really want to do. Um, we just have better glass now and better insulation. And even you could maybe make some arguments against the latter of that because they did have wool and wool is amazing. They just didn't, for some kind of mysterious reasons, choose to insulate their homes very much. I think they were just hard dudes and gals and they just didn't care. <laughs> I think that's maybe part of You can go of near it. the fire, you'll be fine. They, yeah, it's, I have never heard a good explana explanation of, of them not insulating basically at all or very little because um, they sure could have, um, but mostly did it. So, but the first part of the question, um, you know, what, what was that? What, what do I like about, you know, the kind of connect the classic vernacular? Yeah. Yeah. And, and what, what sort of tangents do you, do you pull in for your own work? If yeah. You do? Well, I think the biggest, the kernel of it for me is, is like the positive outdoor space created by connected buildings, creating really awesome windbreaks and microclimates around them. So just creating very high value outdoor spaces is, is a big thing that they do that is, seems really primary, a, a primary value. Um, creating awesome courtyards, basically, and dooryards. Um, and then, you know, the convenience of being able to go between buildings easily, that's a big one. And, you know, especially in the winter and also just to save time, um, the kind of functional, like working nature of the, of working, the, the nature of working buildings being connected to residential buildings or very, very closely uh, positioned is, is massively awesome. Um, so I'd say, yeah, the, just this, those two right there is like reason enough um, to, to, to repeat those patterns in a lot of ways. Um, and basically those patterns are, you know, wholly absent in the modern era on, a, on most places. I mean, people generally are putting buildings too far apart. Um, they're not creating positive outdoor space so much. They're not sheltering from the wind and maximizing solar gain in, in outdoor workspaces. Um, and, you know, just positioning all the buildings for synergy. Um, and I, I don't think that's mostly a, a you know, rash, a rational, um, comes from ra rational decision-making. It's just kind of what we've started to do is spread things out more, but um, having things really clustered in that way like we see in the vernacular connected farm buildings of New England just makes so much sense. I, there is one, the only one downside that I've ever heard brought up about it is for fire. And it is a real downside is if, you know, if one building burns, they can all burn pretty easily. And we had, we had a fire here in a small outbuilding. It's, it's right next to a stall barn, mm. which, which caught as well. Um, and I thought we we're going to lose the whole thing the the firefighters who showed up thought we we're gonna lose the whole thing luckily they, they they stopped it knocked it down and we didn't lose it we just lost that one building which was still a shame um but yeah we we had some of that feel then too it's it, so it's tightly coupled and therefore the cascade can kind of ripple through that yeah system. what what how, what how what started that fire if i may ask 
Yeah. So it was one of two things. So, so the, whatever it was from the insurance company had to come and try to establish the cause. So we were brooding chicks in that building. So there was a heat lamp could have been somehow the heat lamp could have been, they knocked it down somehow. I don't know. We had it tied up. I don't know. Could have been when they came to replace. So, so we had a hanging uh, power line that was then involved in the fire. So, so after that, we had, you know, electricians come out and, and bury a line out to the barn and all that. And when they did that work, they said, you know, a lot of this stuff was, that was left over was very sketchy. So that could have easily been some kind of an electrical fire as well. Um, so something, something along those lines, either a heat lamp or electrical fire. Um, we got, we, I, we woke up to dogs barking, some guy I'd never seen before banging on our window and, you know, pointed down the way to the building and flames were about 30 feet in the air. It was insane. Our wow. daughter was, was six weeks old at the time. So it was quite, uh, quite an interesting moment for us. <laughs> it was, it was a moment that caused us to say, to ask ourselves, what are we doing? Can we do what we're trying to do? Are we in over our heads? All of these things came, mm -hmm. came flooding out at that time. So it was kind of interesting, but yeah, you know, since then, um, all I can say is nothing but we've had nothing but uh, confirmation that, that we are choosing a lifestyle that we enjoy, that we um, beyond enjoy, that we believe is kind of right in many ways. And that actually brings me to what I want to make sure to, to pin you down on a little bit, which is, I'm curious, what led you to pursuing this kind of lifestyle? Is it, was it sort of a pursuit of self-sufficiency or, or something you saw in society, some interaction with those, something else entirely? Well, well, why do you do what you do? And, and, and has that uh, sort of meaning or, or where that fits in for you or how you understand it, has that changed over the years at all? Yeah, well, that's a great question. Um, it was, I think, more mostly motivated by, you know, like you said, the rightness of it by in that, like the ethical implication, because I was like quite an activist in college and I was going to go out to sit in trees, you know, old growth that they were cutting down, you know, out west because still believe you shouldn't cut down the tiny last few trees of old growth in the world. Um, you know, we almost have done, we've almost done that with every, every one of them. There's so few left. Let's, let's, uh, let's not do that. And um, a lot of other just ecological um, catastrophe, you know, just destroying our home. And um, it wasn't until I came into permaculture and ecological design, mostly Holmgren and Mollison's work, that just made it very clear is like, you know, you're a funder, you're a participator in that system. You can't just fight the system that's wrong if you also fund it, you know, fight it with one hand and feed it with the other, which I was doing. And we still all do because we all eat. And I mean, I have electricity running right now. You know, that's that's feeding this hellacious system with one hand, even while I try to spend time with my other hand um, doing something better. Um, so I think I realized then that I need to, you know, just fighting and saying no wasn't going to really work well enough. I need to develop a lifestyle where I'm saying yes and pushing the things that do work, that are functional, that are totally, you know, can ethically be possible um, and do good, not just do less bad. Um, which meant, you know, engaging in the basics of my life, you know, how I feed myself, how I and kept warm, et cetera, et cetera, all the basics. Um, for me, you know, that was a way to go about it. So that's kind of, I think, what motivated me to get into it, to meet some of these basic needs in better ways and not require other people to meet them for me in less, in more ethically dubious ways. Um, it wasn't really because I just wanted to do that. I wasn't like a green thumb or a gardener. I wasn't like, yeah, I just want to plant trees um, per se. I mean, I think it always felt right to be really hands-on. You know, I, I did, I hadn't done a lot of wilderness living and trip leading and wanted to be a mountain guide for a while and spent a lot of time living in, you know, wild places uh, recreationally. So I knew I liked to be self-reliant. I liked to depend on myself kind of live a very hands-on in a hands-on way and so I think this was also a way to live really hands-on but not but in the front country you know not just being like running away from it into the woods all the time so because it always felt wrong too like I'd go 
you know, on a week long backpack trip or mountaineering trip. And it was like, yeah, that's all right. That's, that's a great world. But I was just living on what I took from the friend country world. You know, I wasn't getting any food out there at all my gear and all my food from the front country. And then I was just kind of living on that borrowed resource in an idyllic state, but it wasn't, and I knew it wasn't really that idyllic because I'm like, look at all the stuff I just took from that world to just kind of like, you know, live in this other world. So I, I think ultimately it was like, how can I live in that world in the way that I felt was great, you know, in the back country, but in the front country permanently, you know, not just for a trip here and there. So that was maybe the main motivations. And then I guess over the years, you know, started to realize that I liked it a lot. Um, especially, you know, in the first five years, you know, it started to really resonate. Um, and then I think also it wasn't until then that I started fully appreciating or moving towards full appreciation. I don't know if I still fully appreciate just how fragile and delicate um, and brittle this whole s- global resource system is. And so then at some point, three, five years into it, I started to realize, you know, the, the prepper side of it, you know, started to move, come into it too, of like, you know, I, I want to be more prepared for what I still think are, you know, inevitable, inevitabilities of, of things breaking, of systems, fragile systems breaking that are global and national and uh, and maybe local too um so then that just you know made more sense to do all the things i was doing uh even more i think we're getting into some doomer optimism stuff right there <laughs> yeah and so uh, yeah so so the last couple of years you probably backed off of that right you see it's all it's all uh running <laughs> yeah i was like yeah better. they they fixed it and everything's yeah. gonna be totally fine <laughs> I mean, if we could get into like a little bit more of that sort of cultural commentary, if we can, I mean, you know, so I sort of laid the table a little bit when I reached out to you, Ben, you know, about like the theory behind quote unquote doom or optimism. Um, You know, I think a lot of our commentary that we talk about on Twitter is just, you know, is about, you know, first and foremost, relocalizing and being as, you know, as self-reliant and self-sufficient and interdependent, right? And interdependent locally as we can be. you know, how does that resonate with you? We've talked a lot about like you and what you do or what you do for your clients individually, but like, how do you see this fitting into community? Um, mm-hmm. So maybe if you could comment on that. Yeah, well, I think it, it has to fit into the community for it to be durable in the, you know, in the long run or even mid run. Um, I was never too focused on just like full on, you know, build a bunker on the hill, you know, be ready to fend everyone off. I mean, I, I probably had, I probably was more along those lines at some point than certainly I am now, but um, have, we've worked with people who have kind of that posture. Um, and I, I've always felt like that's just not gonna, that's just not gonna cut it. I mean, it's not really workable, you know, A, like it's not operationally possible really and certainly it's not very not really worthwhile um even if you could do that for a long time you wouldn't really want to wouldn't be a very nice dignified existence (laughs) and um and also i just don't think it's very resilient like the more i manage systems the more i realize that one person or one family even just is not enough of a resource knowledge and skill and tool wise and time wise to, to really even connect all the dots. Like there's so many skills that need to be brought to bear and tooling and know-how to just meet, you know, not even all the basic needs, but just some of them that I think it's kind of an illusion that like any family, especially today is gonna really be able to do that for any length of time without like neighbors who are also skilled and have, you know, systems set up and hopefully you know, there's five, 10, 20 families, 50 families in a area that at least a bunch of them, you know, are really um, capable uh, people. And, and then they can collectively be in, you know, an infinitely better place than any one group can be by themselves. And when I say collectively, you know, that word's a little tough, but I mean, like, 
in a voluntarily uh, association way, rely on each other, you know, for trade and benefiting each other, um, you know, by choice, um, which is, is, you know, very possible. I mean, the, the best thing I feel like I do now in community is trade, is just trading time and resources. And I have, it's easy to get good at something and have too much of it, um, which then you can trade for what you don't have. But it's really, really hard to just manage in such a way that you have enough of all of the things you really need. That's like highly impractical, it seems to me. And I'm someone who likes to do a lot of different things. Like I really am managing a, a very high diversity of systems and like production systems. I'm not geared towards like, hey, I'm just going to be a veggie grower or I'm just going to do cows or I'm just going to do bees or whatever. Like I like to do a lot of different things. And, it, and there's still just lots of holes um, that neighbors, you know, are key for. How... how how is it specifically in, in your community? Like, how, tell us more about how you fit in and maybe, you know, to layer on top of that, like, has it changed at all during COVID? Like, has your community experienced any kind of sort of re-ruralization or, or you know, right. transplants? And, and if you could speak to that experience. Yeah, well, definitely the, the last question is easy to answer. And there's definitely just way, tons of people coming to Vermont and did come to Vermont um, in the areas I live because of covid because well not because of covid but because of all the stuff around covid i think um sure. and so yeah i mean covid the covid event you know accelerated all of the processes that were already underway of like gentrification of people kind of moving in what you know what was slowly to some of these places just went quick for two years um, and it's still happening. Um, and so I think it's just accelerating all those processes. Definitely, probably some advantages in there, but mostly I think a lot of disadvantages because people are coming in with a lot of money. You know, gentrification is definitely a really hellacious process. I used to think of it as like, oh, what a big deal. Gentrification, there's like bigger issues in the world. And, and maybe there are, but it's actually a, a very destructive process. Um, and so that's happening way more in so much, so much of the country and the world, not just Vermont, but definitely Vermont. And, um, you know, almost none of those people coming in are like assets to a more localized future. They're mostly, you know, liabilities in that front. They're not coming in with like skills of how to grow food or manage land, you know, regeneratively or, you know, make basics that people need you know they're not coming into these communities usually with like um skills that and competencies that the local people need um you know they're doing something for some big company and you know that's that's fine but it's not you know they're not it's not contributing to the sustainability of those places um so or they're also just seasonal and they're up you know, here and there. And that's kind of a hollow type of community, you know, when people are just like not full time. Um, the tax, you know, towns like it because they increase the tax base, but then usually the towns just do unnecessary wasteful things with, with the taxes. So, um, yeah, so. I get the sense that your politics are a little bit uh, um, not cleanly left or right. Like yeah. Some some kind of like the, you probably have the experience where people try to place you and they're having trouble and all of that. Oh yeah. I think that, that's one of the things that we're discovering in this. You know, what we're calling doomer optimism here, but this kind of uh, these localists and whatever that are finding one another. That we're all we're not easily categorized into the the big buckets that we have today: Republican, Democrat, Progressive, right. Conservative, whatever. It's like no, there's like a bunch of issues, and they all have their own. Uh, uh, you know, their, their own set of concerns and whatnot. And it's, and any of these buckets that exist that are easy to identify and cluster with are, bring so much nonsense with them that you just can't identify with that. So, so I'm- Oh yeah, no, you know, I'm, I'm politically yeah. homeless, just like I yeah. see here on AC's description. Absolutely. <laughs> there you go, there you yeah. go, politically homeless. Many of us have been, have been abandoned in the, 
<laughs> dogmatic. But I think, I think we might be. Taken, I think we might right. be finding our home again. I think that there's a, yeah. you know, what I call localism, and he's got that on the banner too, is, is that's, I, I say that to bring attention to the scale issue that's sort of orthogonal to right, left, Democrat, whatever. Um, and, and so hopefully there's something to that. But, you know, this gentrification issue is interesting. In my neck of the woods, we've seen some people move in over COVID, but not that many. We're kind of in a, even, you know, my friend grew up less than an hour from here, you know, is all about New Hampshire. And he calls it a black hole here. And it's kind of, it's kind of seems true. I'm in the Monadnock region hmm. and it's just like not people moving in, but our, our, within our cluster on Twitter, there's very lively uh, spirited uh, discussions and debates around gentrification. Yeah. And so, so I do think this is a, this is a very interesting issue because um, it's almost like we used to have when, b- before this was happening, the rural was truly local, but now what's sort of the cosmopolitanism of the cities is now coming into the rural as well. And it's like, so everything's global now. Um, so there's weird tension happening where people are trying to live more locally, but still so connected to the global systems that it's, it's, it's hard to actually parse what's really happening. Are we getting more global or more local or both at the same time or something? I don't know. Yeah. And sorry, that's not really a question, just a, just a comment. Yeah, and I think if I can jump in too, like, um, you know, my personal pet intellectual project, I guess, if you will, is, is you know, what, what would good re-ruralization look like you know non-gentrified good positive re-ruralization look like and you know i think it's absolutely necessary i think it's necessary to mitigate you know the ecological problems that we're facing i think it's necessary 100 percent to, to mitigate the political and social you know socio-political problems that we're having you know one of my favorite ways to frame it and maybe you're familiar with it ben is the vermont papers chelsea mm. green book the vermont papers and it's yeah. basically you know lays out a shire system for Vermont and, and goes into some of the history about why Vermont is, you know, sort of like social libertarian. Mm-hmm. But, you know, it talks about when, when relationships uh, between people are, are bound by place, um, they're, you know, by nature more complicated and, and disagreements need to be dealt with, you know, locally and the roots go deeper among people. And, and I think the quote goes something like, you know, r- rural life breeds, patients with the human condition that's fundamental to successful democracy, right? Like, you know, we can tear each other apart on Twitter because it has no, you know, the stakes couldn't be lower, as Neil Clark right. says, you know, um, and that's totally unhealthy, man. It's, rip, it's ripping us apart. So yeah, I guess getting it back, getting back to like a question, like what would positive re-ruralization look like to you? And, and is it possible? And, and what could be like a good model for that? Yeah, I mean, it is in a, a lot of ways like the question um, that I have been asking for a long time and um, have never really, unfortunately, come to a very good answer. I mean, I, I've been connected with, I used to write for the Vermont Journal, Vermont Commons, which was the secession paper. It's still online, I guess, but I, we had a hard copy and it was distributed all over Vermont. It's amazing this really happened for years. It was a very active journal, totally focused on the question of success, secession from the union, which I do think has to happen for every state, you know, or a region. I don't know that needs to be state based, but that's kind of how we're laid out right now. Um, Amen. And that that was, you know, happening in Vermont. It still is, but it, it kind of got a little quieter. And uh, now it seems even way foreign that that could even be a discussion in Vermont. Um, that's where you guys are way ahead in New Hampshire. <laughs> um, that's right. We just had a bill introduced. Uh, you, you guys have gotten very far ahead of us on that front. Um, but um, yeah, it's um, a question I've always been asking, you know, how, how how can we, you know, organize ourselves here in rural places in a viable way? Because we've been going in a totally non-viable way for, you know, uh, at least a hundred years. I mean, every world war just kind of kept it going and it spun it into a worse direction, essentially, in terms of the sustainability of rural places all over the world, certainly in Vermont. And um, I don't, I don't have any good answers, honestly, because the cost of, of, you know, the people who can afford to be on land are increasingly the opposite of those that have any skills and any know-how to manage those landscapes and so that that conundrum 
it's just so primary. I mean, you know, the people who are, are able to access land now are increasingly those who, you know, the, the, they're not the ones who know how to, who have the time or inclination or skills or background to, to, to use the land well. And so that's, I don't know how to, how, I've never come across a reasonable way to get beyond that. I mean, you know, Vermont Land Trust and different land trusts have taken this challenge up and had subsidized ways of farmers getting on land. And there's been some success with that, but I don't, I don't believe the land trust model as a whole is going to get us there. And that's also become somewhat corrupted and kind of political. Um, but somehow we have to be able to get young, young and mid-age people with skills, you know, onto land, into land tenure situations where they can live on that land for generations, ideally, at least. Um, I, I'm not sure that this, this is not an offering a kind of uh, prescription for a solution, but something you said earlier, so a little bit of doomer optimism to inject here. You said your comment about the, the sort of um, design and architecture of the old homesteads was sort of, they nailed it. And what you said was they nailed it because of all the constraints they were facing. Mm. So the constraints forced them to nail it. My sense is probably what will end up happening is we won't find a sort of rational political solution. It won't be a program we implement. This global system, as you pointed out, there's a lot of fragility in this. We're experiencing some of that supply chain, just a touch of it. People are kind of like, you know, it's a big news story right now. And it's really just the tip of the iceberg of how how bad supply chain disruption could get and what it could mean for food supply and all of that. My sense is that's kind of what we need. We need these experiences of constraint. And only when that really happens, then we'll be able, then we'll understand where to put the buildings. Then yeah. there will be enough of that, that sort of uh, force around that, that drives us to relearn and regain what, what is community and why it matters in a, in a existential and, and perhaps spiritual way. Mm -hmm. um so so i guess that's a, that's kind of doomer optimism from my perspective at least it's sort of something bad but out of that something that we really need to happen can can happen yeah i mean i definitely agree and i have come to think that you know the kind of classic wendell berry view of just like limits are an asset and we need limits and living in this kind of unlimited it never was unlimited but this this um belief that we were beyond limits um, you know, only just destroyed our, us <laughs> and that we, we kind of have to welcome the limits back in, you know, kind of like what's a dignified, you know, energy descent as like Holmgren writes about really well. Um, yeah. How can we kind of have minimal suffering as we downshift into, you know, the, you know, the next phase? Um, yeah, that's where I'm putting my, my efforts really, um, just trying to build that within my family and with my neighbors, you know, and there's only so much you can do, especially on the neighborhood level, because you can't really, you know, pick and choose your neighbors and have much leverage around who moves in. Um, so you can just inspire and, and hopefully, you know, draw, draw good people. Um, but that hasn't, you know, that hasn't really happened that much for us in a surprising way. We've done all sorts of PDC permaculture courses and, you know, I have a wide network, you know, like people know of me in this kind of resiliency world, but it doesn't, it hasn't really resulted in like people moving to this general area and becoming neighbors. And in a lot of ways, that's actually my highest hope, you know, that's like the best thing that could happen to me, <laughs> but it hasn't. So that's like an invitation. If anyone's listening to this, like we got to all we got to find spots and all go to those spots, you know, not one spot because there's too many of us, but. Well, we, we've said it already yeah. and, you know, a little, not, not at the scale that you're talking about now, but uh, regionally New England is looking pretty good in my opinion. So. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Well, Absolutely. we're definitely attracting people. Um, I actually walked around this morning with a couple who wants to move here from Salt Lake city. Cause they're like, this place is just gonna, gonna burn, you know? And um, there's, so there's good and there's there's the right people and you know the people that are more liabilities doing the migration you know 
Right. I wanted to maybe this is good like last question that's sort of last subject maybe but so you mentioned Wendell Berry and you mentioned generation so it always makes me think of my favorite Wendell Berry quote which is something like you know it takes three generations in place to, to really know a place um, and know you know what the health of a place should be, should be like and you know I, I personally think that that is one one place that we should triage right like try to keep people home certainly try to keep rural kids from feeling like they have to uh, move on and move out to, to be somebody, right? Uh, to go places, quote unquote. Um, but maybe if that, that's a way to bring us back to the beginning where you, where, where you talked about fatherhood, you know, how do you, how do you see, how do you see this, this concept of generations in place, you know, fitting into your personal life? Like what sort of vision do you have for your son and your family? Um, to either stay in place or become part of the community or not. Um, and, and, you know, what kind of future life do you envision for your son? Yeah, well, I mean, in, in practical terms, you know, I was telling him yesterday that, or today, that, you know, he's going to have red oak and white oak in his wood pile. Whereas, you know, right now I have red, ma red maple, you know, and birch and stuff that's not nearly as good <laughs> and he's gonna have you know he's gonna have those amazing species and chestnut probably and hickory you know as timber species you know even to, to build with and um so ho hopefully you know if he chooses to to be in these places in the long run um you know there'll be a whole different forest and 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 level of soil and kind of land health to work with um but that's i you know that's not really the limiting factor unfortunately i mean that that's nice for someone to inherit you know the long work that just one generation before started which isn't even that long i mean his kids would have you know the the oak trees i've been planting aren't going to be in there really full gear really rolling until my son's son is my age then they'll be truly getting to be pretty magnificent but just really in their prime um but th those are all great things but they're not enough in of themselves you know to have a viable life i mean if you have a culture around you that's lost its mind or you know is otherwise just become pathological you know that's um, <laughs> you know it's nice but it's not going to get you there so um you know i i worry more you know i always thought we would be moved and stimulated into a better way by physical systems failing first and then social systems would follow suit and what what the last 18 months of this whole craziness has taught me is like that was wrong buddy like it's the social systems are going first and then the physical systems will follow suit <laughs> and i guess that makes sense now that i look at it it's like oh shit that's yeah of course that's how it would go and but i oh never really thought about it that way um not that they're both not always interacting and causing each other but um i guess a roundabout you know way to try to answer your question is like you know, we have to, the, the community culture has to um, heal itself and has to come together and has to become um, more bonded than it is now um, for things to be, you know, a, a good reality, you know, anywhere. Um, but I, I, I hope that happens. I mean, I'm trying to work on that. Those social systems are much harder to work on than the physical systems, I think. Um, and it's not as much also my skill set, but it, they're just, I think they're much trickier, um, less predictable. So, you know, I, I, I do envision him having a great life in these places um, with a lot of, you know, amazing physical resources that have been set in motion in my lifetime, but I feel much less able to affect the social environment that he'll experience what what how, how do you are you trying to tool you know tool him for i guess like a better way of putting it in any way to, to deal with that or, or do you have a plan 
Um, I myself well, yeah, am I struggling mean, with that. I, I have two yeah. toddlers of similar age, and it's like, yeah. man, I, I know, don't have a plan at all. <laughs> on the, the social piece hasn't become um, on the table yet, you know, in terms of dealing with uh, both becoming, you know, how to become a good neighbor. I mean, I guess it is just basic, you know, learning to be polite, learning to share. Those are all neighborly relations. That's what someone his age you know, still needs to learn. I mean, it's what we all need to learn, but they, that's when we start learning it. Um, so, but mostly at this stage, you know, I'm teaching him the names of tools and how to use certain tools and um, learning, you know, he knows a bunch of plants and how to cook and prepare food and, and find food and grow food. So I, I feel like a lot of the hard skills are, you know, we're, we're sharing with him. Um, but, you know, as he gets older, you know, there'll be ever more like, how do we benefit our neighbor? You know, how do we um, be in co-benefit with the people around us? You know, how do we go help neighbors and and find out when neighbors even need help, you know, to begin with and and trade and, and be in positive association? Um, that will be, yeah, that will be a huge, a huge piece of it for sure. Is that is that kind of what you're getting at? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I don't know, you know, so a little bit of history, right? So so I grew up uh, in a rural village in, in New Hampshire and, you know, um, with very few kids around. I was I was the oldest of uh, uh, six cousins. Uh, then we lived, we grew up on a dairy farm and, you know, um, socialization for me was, was, was actually very hard. Like I was sort of like in an entropic situation. Like I was, it was the family unit. It was like literally six people in my elementary class, you know, to larger and larger scopes of people. And I'm just wondering, like, um, uh, you know, is that similar situation for you? I don't know too much about like exactly yeah, where yeah. you are and what like school systems like, like, how do you plan to school your son? Yeah, um, we, he's in school uh, part of two days a week now, and he's a very social kid. And he, you know, he kind of thrives being around a lot of other kids. So we're, we want whatever he thrive. you know, a big part of our life is now what, how does he thrive and what can we do to help him thrive? So um, even if it's somewhat outside of how we live, like that's what we're going to do. Um, and driving him a good distance to school twice a week is not in the pattern of our life, but it's like, it's just because it's good for him right now, it seems. Um, yeah. So I think we're going to try to be, it's day it's month to month, especially with the way things are going on in the world. But our general sense of my wife and I is that, is that we want to walk the line between like being like a full on Amish style, you know, that has its attractive components to us. Like, like definitely do isolate from a lot of negative influence to the, the bridge to like a very social, like public life. I mean, I'm a public school kid. My wife's a public school kid. We both had generally pretty good experiences, at least on the social end. We both had great experiences, like great friends, a lot of fun. Um, and, you know, we, we kind of see a lot of value on that side of things. So we're definitely not on like the hardcore, um, you know, homestead social front in that way. But, you know, we could see moving more. We want to have the social piece actually met within the very immediate community. And we're working on that with neighbors, with their kids. The challenge is there's just not that many kids right around here. Yeah, that's And big... even though there's a lot of interest, most parents, you know, have to leave home and go to work all day and they don't have any extra money to like join our sweet little homeschooling thing we're trying to start because they either have to pay or volunteer their time because someone, you know, it has to be, it needs a staff. And uh, so the public school, you know, it already took their money so they can have it free. You know, that, that's already an option. You drop them off, you already paid for it. And um, so, you know, maybe some at some point we'll start a charter school or some way of making that happen more. But, you know, our big topic, I mean, our main thing is how do we create the educational social environment for him where he wouldn't even have to leave the property or be right in this hollow that we live in with at least the three to five kids, ideally like 10, 
Um, and that that's a that's our that's our project now for sure. I think awesome. you're going to find, uh, especially as time ticks on here, a lot of allies on that project, um, both locally and less locally. So I'm, yeah. I'm, actually, I'm well, the world is going coming to it for sure. Right. Yeah. So I, that's something I'm, I'm, we're a little further off, a couple of years behind. Um, but we're also thinking about that already, talking about, a lot about it, throwing around ideas like you are, like maybe we'd start a charter school, maybe we'd start a school, you know, that kind of thinking, you know, maybe we'll do homeschool, maybe we'll homeschool co-op, all these possible models. I, I It's not something I personally stress about because it's, I see that's important, but I do, it's just more and more like day to day, almost time scale. more and more people are taking on these kinds of perspectives and asking these kinds of questions. So I think that, you know, the way information travels, the way, you know, memes spread, memetics uh, are, are contagious and whatnot. I, I, I think we're going to see a lot of new models popping up. I think there's a lot of people who, who are wondering, you know, whether they can really just take their kids to the public school and, and, and just kind of hope for the best. <laughs> so I'm, I'm pretty optimistic on that one. Yeah, no, I am too. It's just, you know, whether how much of that happens, you know, soon enough, you know, every year, every day, the right. kids growing, you know, right. but it, it is, there's tons of interest, you know, even in our small little community, um, for sure. And, you know, the, right. I mean, the school system, I view the school system as being broken for, you know, many, many, I mean, maybe for the whole time, I mean, decades and decades and decades. And now it just got like, <laughs> contorted into something even more broken, you know. Yep. Well, maybe it's a good a good touch point to, to follow up in the future to see how that project's going. Uh, sure. We, yeah, we, that's we, our that's our job it. now. <laughs> we we've taken we've taken up a bunch of your time. Uh, re really appreciate your uh, willingness to join us. Uh, hopefully, people get a flavor for, for what it is what you do. How how can people follow along with your work? If you could give yourself a plug. Um, sure. Um, probably the. The best way is to keep on, you know, just sign up for our newsletter, which is funny I say that because I haven't sent out a newsletter in like probably at least a year, but I keep meaning to. Um, and I am active on Instagram. So that will be, that's a good way to just get like some update on what we're doing and, uh, you know, get pissed off too about stuff because <laughs> I try to stir the pot there. I, Although I, I would actually, one of the things I want to make sure to inject is, I will make the, the, uh, it's a soft request. It's not a real request, but a lot of action on Twitter and getting pissed off too, especially, but even other things, even besides getting pissed off, you know, Instagram, the only reason I've logged onto Instagram in the past 12 months is to actually look at your page. Really? No one else's just to look at what you're up to. Yeah. When I first, yeah. So you took a break from Instagram for a while, actually, when yeah. I moved into this place, I was like, ah, oh, shit, I was kind of hoping to follow this guy. Yeah. I kind of like left it for a year and I will be doing that again <laughs> at some point. That's not a bad but, idea. Yeah. That's good to hear. I've never, I made a Twitter account once 10 years ago and I never used it, but, um, I, I don't know. I kind of got to move the other way off of these things. I think. <laughs> fair, fair enough. Fair enough. Well, if you but if you do find yourself addicted to the screen or whatever, sure. You no, know, there's a lot of uh, friendly faces on Twitter over there. So yeah, yeah. No, it seems like well, it seems it seems more attractive now than it used to because it just seems less right. You know, it seems less um, policed and and suppressed than you know Zuckerberg's platforms. So, for now. For but now. yeah, for now. For now. I'm sure that, yeah. But, um, you know, that's why I say sign up for the newsletter, because then I'll, I'll be there for sure, always, hopefully, versus maybe not on the social media for too much longer, although who knows. Um, and then, you know, we have our permaculture course every year, and that's a great way of being involved. Um, an apprenticeship for people who want to get really hands on in the spring. Um, the, my YouTube channel, I, I will try to keep, keep, keep keeping up with that uh, here and there, too. And folks should buy your book. I can't believe we've gone this long without mentioning your book. So yeah, I do have a book. <laughs> it's, and I need to be working on a revision. I am actually working on a revision that's going to come out. Well, it'll be done in December and then it'll come out probably like late winter. The awesome. Resilient Farm and Homestead, right? Yep, The Resilient Farm and Homestead by Chelsea Green Press. And uh, yeah, that's a, that's a nice resource too. Fantastic. Awesome. It, it absolutely is a very nice resource. I will echo that one for sure thanks
Ben, thank you so much. Um, we appreciate it. We hope we can get you on another time, maybe to talk talk schooling and other parenting yeah. uh, challenges. Um, I think that the, the theme of the podcast has, for whatever reason, uh, you know, the outro is cutting off the guest uh, mid mid sentence. <laughs> so we're we're gonna give you the last word, uh, but don't take it too seriously because uh, Tress is gonna pull the trigger on you. So uh, <laughs> we we appreciate you joining us, Ben. <laughs> Sure. Well, it was good to be here, guys. And uh, I look forward to um, 